Well, it's been so wonderful to have you. It's so wonderful. Come and, come and sit down. We are so thrilled to have you uh, with us today. As you can see, we're so appreciative of your presence with us. I'd love to ask you, first of all, because um, I, I, obviously some people here will know the Coptic Orthodox Church well, but others won't be familiar even with orthodoxy itself. So just, just describe, first of all, the, the difference, for example, what is the difference between, what are the major differences between, say, the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church? Well, I want to start by saying orthodoxy, I feel, uh, for some people, and many of you out here, I, I, us I usually liken to uh, one of those very old dubbed movies where the picture doesn't go with the sound. So when you see it, you think it's quite archaic, quite sort of me medieval, not really having a handle on the world. But actually, it's, it's a church that witnesses um, substantially. Um, it is a, a scriptural church where you read the Bible for Old and New Testament, as well as the apocryphal books. Uh, we're a traditional church, a sacramental church, Trinitarian, believing in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Some of the greatest fathers of the Christian church who established the creed that we all use um, were from Alexandria, Athanasius, Cyril, um, the monastic life that if you see any monk in the world at the moment or none, they have their origins in the wilderness of Egypt. I know this sounds a little bit like my big fat Greek wedding, but you know, <laughs> where everything goes back to kimono, but I'm really sorry it doesn't because, it, you know, the fourth century, St. Anthony started monasticism and from there uh, it spread all over the world. So it's had very um, big contributions to Christianity. But as a living church now, it's actually quite vibrant the way it lives. We're a very hands-on ministry, uh, pastorally. We take a lot of care with children's ministry and youth ministry. We um, look after families preemptively so we don't have to deal with lots of issues, but we actually prepare people. And that, you know, I know about your marriage preparation courses and, and all of that sort of preemptive. We have very similar services like that. Um, ecumenically, we're also very engaged. So throughout the centuries, the, the, the Church of Alexandria um, actually um, was part of the wider Church of God. You know, up to the fourth century, there was no Catholicism or Orthodoxy or Protestantism. Mm -hmm. There was the Church of God. And in every one of our masses, our liturgies at the moment, we read for the one holy universal Church of God, that we're all coming back together as the body of Christ. So we believe in that even until today, where we have um, official, unofficial dialogues with the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Communion, which we're re-establishing this year in October, uh, the Evangelical Alliance, the Lausanne Movement, and various other, the Eastern Orthodox. So we, we engage at every level trying to bring this unity of the body of Christ to become a reality. Mm. And the Coptic Orthodox Church itself, um, so that, the East, just describe how that separated, it was the 451, wasn't it? Calcedon. Now, there are two families of Orthodoxy. There's the Eastern Orthodox family and there's Oriental Orthodox family. The Eastern Orthodox is the Greeks, the Russians, the Eastern Europeans. The Oriental family is our family, which is the Coptic Orthodox, Syrian, Armenian, Ethiopian, Eritrean, and Indian. Um, the separation was one of, but I was saying this yesterday to you, at best, it's just bad semantics. At worst, it was very bad politics at the time, yes. where Alexandria was quite a small sea, Byzantium was quite a large sea politically, and they didn't want that sort of that mixing. Um, we were accused of um, believing only one nature of Christ, and, but we're not. We're monotheistic. We believe in one God, but we believe in two natures of Christ, humanity and divinity together. So the person who was walking on this earth, Christ was God in flesh. Now, our fathers have always said that, our theology has always said that, so that's always been our, our driver. We have a dialogue now with the Eastern Orthodox family, it's been going for about 20 years, and it's come a long way. We've signed the Christological agreement saying we believe in the same Christ in the same way, which is quite significant. And that same agreement we've signed with um, the Roman Catholic Church, actually, I was in Rome only uh, about two months ago. You were with the Pope? With, the with, with our Pope, the new Pope, visiting the Roman Catholic new Pope. <laughs> and Can I just describe, yeah, just, just pause a moment, because a, a lot of people, we, we often think there's one Pope in the world. Well, actually, now two Popes in the world, yeah. with Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. But, but, but we, we think of it, but that actually, you, you, the Coptic Orthodox Church, for example, you have a, a Pope. Yeah. Well, the only two churches in the world that use the title Pope are the, church, the Pope of Rome and the Pope of Alexandria, the Roman Catholic Church and the Coptic Orthodox Church. 
It was a very good meeting, I think. It was a, a groundbreaking. It actually marked the 40th anniversary of the signing of that Christological agreement in 1973 between the then Pope Schnuder and Pope Paul VI. So we've gone a long way, and that same agreement sets the foundation in our dialogue with the Anglican Communion. And as I said, it was stalled through various things, but it's now being re-established and starting again here in England in October of this year. And your new pope, you had a, a new pope. Uh, just describe how that process goes about and when that happened. It's a wonderful process. It, it really annoys me when people and tabloids try to simplify it and saying, oh, your pope is chosen by a child, mm. which technically at the last point, but it starts by having nominations of, um, of popes or of bishops or monks as candidates. Then we have a nominations committee that then screens these and brings them down to between five and seven final candidates. We then have a democratic vote, representation of all the dioceses all over the world. And the top three names then are chosen and they are placed on the altar, they're sealed, placed on the altar, we have a mass, we have a liturgy. We pray it and then one of the names is chosen. We traditionally use a child because a child is apolitical and, and it shows that it's a godly act. And uh, it was a wonderful way at that time in particular because Egypt and the whole world was seeing a transition of leadership in the church and a transition of leadership in the country in Egypt. And they looked and compared and saw God's grace in Christianity and in Christ. And that was a, a really good witness in itself. We also had the locum tenants, who was the, in, the acting patriarch at the time, who showed incredible strength throughout. And then on the last day, when the new pope was being enthroned, he made an incredible speech and said, I've been heading the church now as interim, I now go back, and he, he's our most senior metropolitan, I now go back as a spiritual son to our new pope and stand to serve him however I can. And people saw that and thought, you know, in the world we don't have that graciousness mm. and that humility when it comes to power. Everyone's trying to grab power. Um, and that was a great witness in itself. Now tell us about your own story, because you, you were born in Egypt? I was. I was born in Egypt, migrated to Australia with my family when I was five. Um, I lived there all my life, was educated there, went back to Egypt to join the monastery. Tell us about your call to be a monk. I think in retrospect it all makes a lot of sense. But at the time I felt a very strong call to leave everything behind. And I, you know, I was working, I was serving extensively in the church, I had my circle of friends, I was living like you know, most people in churches do. And I felt a calling to give all of that up and go and live in the monastery. Now I thought at the time I'd be going to live in the wilderness. Now monasteries are actually in the deserts. And I thought I'd be going to live there for life. Um, but when I got there, I was selected to serve as private secretary to the late Pope Shenouda. Um, and I served as his secretary and his disciple for six years. And then he sent me out here as a, as a monk priest to serve um, our parish in Hertfordshire in Stevenage. And I served there as four years as a monk priest. And then I, w I became a bishop in 1999. And you had a particular role that he appointed you to, to do with youth? Well, yes. Um, I, I've always done a lot of youth ministry. And whereas that was very UK-based, now be, being a bishop, it's, it's almost international. I just came back from Australia yesterday. Um, I do youth ministry in English-speaking countries. I'm off to the States next weekend for conventions, retreats. We also have an extensive, an extensive youth ministry here. We run 12 different youth programs here in the UK ranging from homeless ministry to, to, um, to arts ministry, sports ministries. We have a wonderful team working on that. Amazing. And obviously you've spent still a lot of time in Egypt you, because your monastery is in Egypt. Just describe where your monastery is and the, the history of that. Monastery is in the, in the deserts uh, between anyone who's been to Egypt. It's halfway between Cairo and Alexandria, area called Wadi Natrun, St. Bishoy Monastery. It dates back to the fourth century. Uh, I was telling Nikki that one day I had a particular epiphany. I was walking down a corridor and I suddenly felt shivers in my spine. And it was the realization that monks had been walking up and down this corridor for 1,400 years hmm. on this soil, uh, praying in this church. And that's, that's the beauty of it. But then it's also very lived. 
when I was leaving the monastery, I spoke to my abbot and said, you know, what am I going to do now? He said, the most important thing is not that the monk lives in the monastery, but that the monastery lives in the monk. Hmm. And so you take that calling and you take that reflection, you take that ability to spend quiet, quality time with God together because the foundation of monasticism is to leave all to be with the one. And we take the same three vows as monasticism all over the world of, of, of um, uh, poverty, obedience, um, and celibacy. So spending time with God. And that, you know, I always tell people, we can do that in our world today. You don't need to be in the desert to spend time with God. You've got to, you've got to be able to have your own wilderness in your room. I sometimes, because I do a lot of driving in my ministry, so I call my car my wilderness. Mm. Um, I spent a lot of time there. And we need that quiet time where we retract from the world. And heaven forbid that we might turn our mobile phones off just in case the world comes to an end or something. Or, you know, you don't look at, 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 at your social media or you, you don't engage with the world outside your walls for the best part of 15 minutes because that could be tragic for humanity as we know it. But I think we need to really shut down from that and be able to spend that time with God to build a relationship. It's like any relationship. The more time you spend, the more time you reflect, the more time you give into it, the more you receive out of it. You know, many people say, I can't find God. It's because we're not really seriously looking, we're waiting for God to fall on us. And even when he does, we choose him selectively based on what we are or are not doing at, in life at the time. And when you say that, spending time with God, what is that, what is that like for you? What is that, how does, how is, is there a structure to it? Is there some particular way which... For me, because of my, my heavy pastoral role, and, and it has to be very early in the morning, so for me it's sort of from six to seven in the morning. That is my time where hopefully I don't get phone calls and don't do things, but that's when I, my phone goes to silent and I spend time personally. Um, what I like to do and what I advise people to do is to read whatever I'm reading in Scripture, read my Bible, and then try to apply that on the day before and see whether I've actually lived what I've just read. And then reflect on, if I didn't, how I can, and if I did, how I can apply it better to my day ahead. Mm -hmm. And it's really then spending time to be able to listen to God. We, I think when we're speaking about prayer, a lot of us think that prayer is just a lot of noise, mm -hmm. whether it's audible or inaudible. It's just, it becomes a monologue. Whereas we don't spend enough time listening to God. We don't spend enough time just waiting to be inspired by Him and led by Him. And I think it's very important for us to have that quiet time. We, we, I think we feel so engaged in what we do that we have to always be doing something. And not doing something is almost a waste of time. Mm. Whereas there is a lot of time within our tradition, especially because monasticism was such a, a huge part of who we are, there is a lot to be said for just spending time quietly and listening to God. But that takes training. Um, there's a, an old story of a monk who was looking out of his cell and saw another fellow monk walking in circles around his cell. And he said, what are you doing? He said, well, I was coming to my cell and I was preoccupied by a certain thought. And I thought if I didn't get rid of it before I walked into my room, I wouldn't be able to pray. Hmm. We, we almost try to walk out of the world, hit the ground running into our rooms while everything's still processing and thinking we can shut down and pray. Hmm. Whereas it does need a time, a buffer almost, mm -hmm. of trying to empty ourselves out and open ourselves up to receiving. Otherwise, if we're too full, then we've got nothing to receive into. Mm. And, and we're full by so much um, that the more we open ourselves up and receive from God, the more we're able to, to grow. And this, of course, for you is in the middle of a very, very busy life, particularly now. I mean, you've been spent quite a lot of time in Egypt recently, haven't you, with all the... Tell us a little bit about what you see happening. The, the, the Coptic church in, in Egypt has been through a, a terrible time. Well, I mean, as you said earlier, we've been there since the first century. Um, and it's, it's funny to, to see Middle Easterners. You know, people don't remember that Christianity started in the Middle East. It's not a Western export. <laughs> um, as much as it would be when we were there. It would be very nice, I suppose. But I met a, one of Palestinian uh, who was who was a tour guide, always very offended by you know very righteous Westerners who would say, "So when did you come to Christ?" Mm. We'd say about two thousand years ago. When did you come? <laughs> um, 
So, you know, when you look at, those of you who have studied history, when you look at Diocletian and what he did, we, we lost millions purely for being Christians. They lost their lives. Whole cities and towns were wiped out. Um, the entry of you know, the Islamic invasion and so on. So we've had quite a, a serious history of persecution, but I just addressed General Synod of the Church of England in York. Because you're on two the weeks General ago. Synod. I, yeah. I am, yes. I, I, addressed, I was very graciously invited to address General Synod two weeks ago. And I said to them, that wasn't a weakness, it was actually a strength. Because in Christianity we know that persecution is actually the cross we bear and it is the resurrection that comes out of death. It's, it's the empty tomb that comes out of a, you know, after a cross. So what's happening in Egypt now, it's actually very exciting. Because I feel that God is working in incredible ways. You know, to, Egypt is 80% Muslim, and that's understood. We're going to have a majority Muslim government, that's understood. But when you have an Islamist agenda that tries to change the, the, the hallmarks of Egypt and tries to transform it into an Islamist, not an Islamic state, an Islamist state. Um, most Egyptian people rejected that. And you know, I'm tired of, of this whole, was it a military coup or was it not a military coup? I think we need to get out of people's lives and let countries rule themselves, whether it's Egypt or, I mean, we've had incredible successes, I think, so far in Afghanistan and Iraq, don't you think? And I think we, we need to leave people to do their own thing so we don't have any more disasters. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to look at um, how God is working and using these opportunities and actually be able to guide our lives. So this Islamist regime actually fell apart in 12 months. No one ever expected that. Mm -hmm. And I think what this will lead to is a much greater unified Egypt. People are now rejecting the Islamist line. It's no, you know, it's broken down the barrier. When you look at Tahrir Square, when you look at all these squares, you look at the incredible aerial footage. It's broken down these boundaries of Christian, Muslim, religious, civil. It's now become a much more united front that wants to live a good life for all Egyptians. So I'm very excited. I just, what I pray for and what I hope for now is real reconciliation. You know, I, I I, I try to tweet once or twice a day just on, on things that I find important. And one that I sent out yesterday was that if we know that the end game is going to be cooperation and coexistence, no matter how long this scuffle ends, why prolong it? Why have increased loss of life and destruction? So let's start on reconciliation now. Let's start on working together. And whether you're talking about a nation or you're talking about married couples, I mean, you know that at the end of the day, it'll be reconciliation. The longer you leave it, the more misunderstanding you get, the more, the more trouble you get, the more you have to make up for, and the more things are said and done that can't be retracted. So what I'm hoping for in Egypt is reconciliation, true reconciliation. We had reconciliation under past regimes, which was um, a propaganda reconciliation. You know, it was shaking hands, hugging, kissing babies, wanting people to think everything was okay. Whereas actually there was no invest investment in nation building. There was no investment in national reconciliation between Christians and Muslims, between Muslims and Muslims. The first attacks that happened after the uprising in 2011 was not on, on churches. It was on Muslim Sufi shrines. And we had, um, we had some Muslims who were killed just for being Shiites. Mm. So I think it's a matter of being able to be accepting and live with people and to have that understanding that it's a shared environment, it's a shared community. Of course, there are attacks on churches and Christians, but I'm very thankful to the graciousness of Christ within us that has never led anyone to retaliate. Because I think the minute we retaliate, that's the end. The minute we retaliate with aggression, with violence, that'll be the end. And it's, it's, it's incredible to see everything we've seen over the past you know, 2,000 years, and in particular in the past 20 years. You know, in the past two years since the uprising, we've had more deaths than in the 20 years prior to that. Mm. So we've had our own fair share, but this not once. This is Coptic Christians Coptic, being the killed. Christians, yes. yeah. yeah. So not once has anyone decided to retaliate violently. Mm. And that in itself shows incredible grace mm. and God's work. The whole area of reconciliation is one that I know you're very involved in, in, in unity and church unity. 
And um, you've recently, so you've recently been on a trip to Rome with, so just describe it, because it, it, it was an extraordinary moment in church history when we had a new Pope in the Catholic Church, uh, a new Archbishop of Canterbury, yes. but also at the same time, in the same period, you also had a new Pope. Yes. I was at a meeting of, the, of churches together in Britain and Ireland, which is the ecumenical body here. And there was myself and two of our fellow bishops, an Anglican and the Catholic, and I turned down and said, you really do realize we're all under new management right now. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's incredible that this all happened at the same time. And it's, it's, it's providence, it's what God wants. The meeting in Vatican, I, I traveled with Pope Tawadros to meet Pope Francis, which is a wonderful, gracious meeting, very open and very positive, and I think it will bring about a lot of change and dynamics. So we've always had good relations, well, fraternal relations, whether it's here in England or throughout the world. What did you make of Pope Francis? Wonderful man. I mean, the one thing is protocol has gone out the window. He's driving everyone absolutely crazy. In the <laughs> when, when we turned up, he was standing at the door waiting for, for Pope to address and our delegation to arrive. That doesn't happen. Um, he sat and he had lunch with us. Uh, so he's a very gracious man, I think. Uh, he doesn't wear red shoes. I don't know if you've, that, that was a big scandal. Hmm. If he, he's broken lots of conventions, and I think what he's trying to do is to actually change the way things are happening. And I, I you know, so I was with Pope Toadros at the Vatican, and only two weeks later, I was fortunate enough to also be in Cairo when Archbishop Justin came to visit Pope Toadros. Now tell us about that meeting, because that was, Archbishop Justice, Justin went to meet Pope Tawadros. Uh, yeah. and, and you were involved in that. Lisa. Yes. How did that come about? Well, uh, Archbishop Justin, I think, wanted one of his first trips to be into the Middle East. So he went from Egypt to Jordan to Palestine, the Palestinian territories. Um, started with Egypt to visit Bishop Munir, who's the Episcopal yeah. Bishop there. He's a wonderful man, a very dear friend. And um, it, it happened that I was going to be in Cairo at the same time anyway. And so I was sitting on the flight wondering, I'd known from Lambeth Palace that the Archbishop was going to be on the same plane. And then I saw a good friend, Jonathan Goodall, his secretary, walking up. So, oh, Jonathan, how are you? Where's the Archbishop? Looked down, he was sitting in the seat in front of me. <laughs> so we ended up being on the same flight to Cairo. And then spent some time there as soon as we arrived. Spent some time the following day. I attended a graduation ceremony at All Saints Cathedral, the Anglican Cathedral in Cairo, and spoke there as well. So I think, again, that was a way of God mobilizing all this. I had a very good relationship with um, Archbishop Rowan yeah. for, for the past 10 years, and we're still in contact until now. Um, and I thought, how are we going to do this after 10 years reestablishing your relationship? But I really feel that those 24 hours we spent together were then catapulting us into a relationship. We met in York again a couple of weeks ago, and I was there, uh, and also with Archbishop John Centum, who's also a wonderful man. And, and did the meeting um, go well in Cairo, the meeting? Yes, absolutely. It was a, a meeting of minds. There was a meeting of directions, um, talking about, again, common witness, common friendship, how we work together. I think it's very important to realize that this is about relationships. It's about relationships. It's about I mean, my, my relationship with yours, or with yourself, who started over 10 years ago. A relationship with lots of friends in the ecumenical world here in the UK and around the world. And I think building those personal relationships is what leads us to common witness, is then what leads us to a greater testimony of who we are. Just talk a bit about that. Why is it so important, this unity is so important? I know you believe that, but why, why do you believe that unity is so important? Because I believe that despite all of us, God still considers us as his unified body. Mm. We're fragmented at the moment, mm. but we are still his body. The, the church is the body of Christ. And as I said, in our services, we pray for that um, every day. Mm. So I, I believe that we need to... Mm. Can, we, can we get a... Different... We've lost... No, we're back. 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 It's okay. Thanks. Keep it here, just in case. Um, so, I, mean, I believe that we need to continue striving for this, because I believe that as Christians, we have a very important role to play. We are, we are light. We are salt, whether we like it or not. We like to ignore it sometimes, turn away from it, but we are, and we are meant to proclaim, and we are meant to be visible. We're not supposed to be closet Christians. That doesn't work. 
uh, if, if we can witness in Egypt, and people can still witness in Syria and Iraq, in China, in Nigeria, then we can witness in this country. Hmm. And I don't think we have to be apologetic about it. I think we need to be strong. And I feel the stronger we get in our unity, the more we dispel this theory that says that religion is a source of division and conflict. Mm -hmm. It's actually Christianity is a unifying force. Mm -hmm. And it's a power. You know, when you, when you read Acts 2 and you hear about the mighty rushing wind, mm -hmm. but the mighty rushing wind required the presence of the apostles being of one accord in one place. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be of one accord in one place to have that happen to us today. The same Holy Spirit who worked 2,000 years ago is the one who can work through us today. We just limit him because we're in our own camps. Mm. We limit him because of, and, and you know, one other thing I think is very important is to call a spade a spade. And we've had a, a lot of history for ourselves in, in Egypt of having missions coming in and proselytizing, taking already existing Christians and just taking them to other denominations. And so when, when I was in Cape Town for the Luzon Movement meeting in 2010, met with some friends there, and they referred to some places as unreached. So I was referred to as unreached. <laughs> I've been reached for 2,000 years. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, excuse me for my flippant nature. I don't know. <laughs> some things really annoy me. Yeah. Um, and so I had a conversation with some friends there and have actually managed through that cup of coffee of someone saying, who are you and what are you doing here? Obviously, don't look evangelical. <laughs> to, to be able to start a, a, an international initiative now with the Luzon movement. We've, I was in Bangalore two weeks ago addressing the Global Leaders Forum, and we've got an international meeting happening in Albania in September of Orthodox and Evangelicals from Orthodox majority countries to see how we can witness together and work together. And I think it's important for us to, to, to flush out where the problems have been, to, to have reconciliation and healing so we can move ahead. Mm -hmm. If we keep denying reality and we keep living in apparent unity but actually not trusting each other, mm -hmm. then that's not going to get us anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you see things? I mean, you, you've been in the UK now for quite some time. What do you see happening here? I've been here for 18 years now. And I personally feel that Christianity is on the rise. Uh, a lot of it thanks to the black-led churches, yeah. and they're doing an incredible amount of work. Um, to, to, and I don't mean to say this because I'm here in your church, but HTB and what it's doing in re-establishing life in you know, closed and very dormant parishes throughout London. I think that's, that's a, it, it's a win for us. When, when, we, when we talk in scripture about when one part of the body rejoices, the whole body rejoices, we need to stop thinking that, well, if Nikki's doing well, then I must be doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Because there is great opportunity for us to actually be doing both. Well, you've been so encouraging to us over the years, I know, your, the friendship that we've had. And... I, 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 I think it's, it's inspiring that Christians are working more. I'm being directed. Do I need to use my microphone? Mm -hmm. Yes? Sorry. Is that better? Oh. oh. I'm sorry. Do I have to say all of that again? No. <laughs> no. Now just, just let's I have go. no just idea me, what just I just tell said. Me, just tell me about the Orthodox Church. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's start from the beginning, though. <laughs> um, oh, dear, that's so sad. Have you not been able to hear anything for the last 30 minutes? <laughs> you have. You have. Okay, I'm so glad. It's okay. It's actually better. They're able to zone out when they want to. It's better <laughs> that way, I think. Tell us what, what, what message would you have for us, just um, as a final... Um, ending to this. We'd love to, just what, what's on your heart and um, what would you like, like to say to our congregation? First of all, I'm thankful to be here amongst you and to be able to pray with you here. Secondly, I would ask your prayers for the Middle East generally, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Libya, where, where Christians are suffering, Africa, Nigeria in particular, China, where people, you know, the incredible work happening. So countries where we, people aren't as fortunate as we are, we're not, they're not able to witness and, and worship and pray as, as easily as us, but who actually sometimes, I'm sorry to say this, put us to shame because of their incredible strength and, 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 and diligence. So we need to pray for them. And we also need to pray for our common witness here in England, that we don't shy away from being a prophetic voice that speaks truth 
even if that truth is very, very unpopular. We do it graciously, we don't do it offensively because that would go against Christ and his message to us. So we speak with power and we speak with grace, but we also speak the truth. And so I, I, I would like you to, to share with me in that prayer. And also, of course, you know, pray for me and our ministry, as I promise you that we'll pray for you and for all of you and for yours, because I think we're also supported and strengthened by each other's prayers. Bishop Angelos, thank you so much. Thank you so much.